Thank you. Uh, I think John's given half of my talk already. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'd like to talk about canals and solar cells, uh, building infrastructure and building sustainability. And uh, we will be talking uh, about a little bit of history, which I think is too often forgotten, uh, about some of the bold decisions that were made that were so important in terms of building a rich nation that we have. Uh, and then we'll move to talking about a sustainable future. Both of these things will be having a very strong Toledo thread running through them. Uh, so I'll be talking about four major infrastructure projects, canals, railroads, highways, and an electrical grid. And then we'll talk about the power and the financing that were so important for building those. It begins with uh, canals, the Erie Canal we all know about. And this reduced the cost of transportation from New York to Buffalo. Of course, if you make it to Buffalo, you're practically in Toledo, right? Uh, by 95%, it reduced the cost. Uh, so that led to the interest in the Wabash and Erie Canal. That ended up being the longest canal in, uh, in the US, 460 miles, starting in Toledo, of course, and getting to the Ohio River. And there you could get all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. The important thing about that is how it was financed, at least for, for, for our purposes today how it was financed. It was financed by taking land and giving it to the industries that were building the canals. So for example, by the time the canals were done in Indiana, 6% of the land of Indiana was given to the canal builders. In Ohio, 4% of the land. What does that mean in terms of today's land values? That would be worth $5 billion to $10 billion at a minimum. I took numbers that were for agricultural land in the western part of the state of Ohio. So there was a huge transfer of wealth from the federal government to private industry for building the canals. But as soon as the canals were built, along comes another major innovation, and that's the steam engine. And that uh, was actually going to replace the canals. So the canals did not get used for very long, actually. Um, but it also led to an opportunity. And that was to open up the West. Um, and the, the, the president that led us for that was the great Abraham Lincoln. Actually, during a time of great national tragedy, the Civil War, there were five Pacific Railroad Acts that made it possible to build the railroads. How was it financed? Land, right? Land was given to the railroads um, uh, in order for them to build the, those, those road, that railroad system. So this map shows the structure of the railroads by 1870 or 1871. Huge land grants that were given to the railroads. Uh, 80 railroads ended up owning about 7% of the continental United States by the, by the 1870s. And this is how it was financed. I have a little bit of a personal connection there. My great grandfather in North Dakota was one of those types of people that uh, ended up buying some of the land from the railroads. Um, and of course, then they were dependent on the railroads for bringing in the lumber. North Dakota doesn't have a lot of trees, you know. Uh, and uh, also the hardware the, for the windmills and the appliances and so on. So they became dependent on the railroads. But it wasn't long before there was another innovation, the automobile. And that connects us again to Toledo and Detroit and so on. And what does the automobile need but some infrastructure, some very good infrastructure? And so there was a beginning of a, a lot of road building. The biggest road building project in America's history was started in 1956 with another great president, Eisenhower. Uh, this was justified on the basis of a defense need in the Cold War. It ended up being a 35-year construction project. And it was the largest infrastructure project in America's history. How was it financed? Well, the land was mostly given away. At least the federal lands were mostly given away, uh, except those that were set aside by Teddy Roosevelt for the national parks. Um, but it was financed by increasing the gas tax. So this was a, a, there was a lot of difficult discussion in Congress, but Eisenhower was able to get it through. So there was an increase in the gas tax that paid for this major construction infrastructure project. And this is a, the network of interstate highways that we still benefit from today and that our commerce and industry uh, depends very heavily on. 
One more uh, major infrastructure project, and this was the electricity grid. Um, in the cities, uh, electrical lines had been established, but out in the countrysides, it was too expensive for these for private industry to set up those lines. And so, the, uh, the Rural Electrification Administration was started by another one of our great leaders, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, and the REA then established the funding that would pay for installing the electric transmission, the electricity transmission transmission lines uh, over in the rural areas. And this access to electricity completely changed rural life and integrated into the rest of the society. Again, I have a personal uh, connection there. This was the place where I was born. My parents were small home, uh, shop owners there. Um, we had a small, what we call the wind charger, and a little bit larger one that were used to charge the batteries that then provided the electricity for running the, the service station. But the REA came through and added the, the major infrastructure that made, then reduced the cost of the electricity and uh, helped to really promote the growth of agriculture in the United States. <clears throat> All of these infrastructure projects require energy. And so energy is another big part of our story. Um, we need power for the transportation systems. We need power for the electricity. Uh, and it's very important to understand, not to forget the history of how we finance those kinds of acquisitions. Here I've taken some uh, data from the uh, Energy Information Administration and used that together with census data to give you a graph that shows the U.S. energy use per person. And you can see that in the middle of the 1800s, we were, uh, our energy was coming from wood. Uh, 60 years later, we were using coal pr primarily. And another 60 years later, we were using oil and gas. Uh, we are now ready for another transition. And you can see on the graph there, nuclear has kind of stabilized. It's never going to be a major source of energy for us, I believe. But renewables start, is starting to rise very rapidly. Now, these kinds of transitions don't happen spontaneously. They were accelerated by government policy. So for example, for timber, land grants to timber companies in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s came to the tune of about $25 billion per year to uh, stimulate that uh, industry. Coal in a similar way, was receiving subsidies of about $25 billion per year. In fact, the first uh, uh, protection for coal was done at the time our Constitution was being signed, in 1789. And, uh, and some of that subsidy is continuing into the 21st century. Now, the more modern forms of energy, oil and gas, <coughs> is rec has received now for 90 years uh, $5 billion, more than almost $5 billion per year in subsidies. Nuclear, for about 50 years, has received about $3.5 billion. And that's how we've stimulated those kinds of transitions. Biofuels, much less. And renewables hardly show up on this kind of graph. Now, it's important to recognize that those old forms of energy, coal, oil, natural gas, those have very important uh, emissions associated with them. So we have carbon dioxide emissions. We have mercury emissions sulfur dioxide, and so on. Furthermore, that, those resources are limited, so the costs are continuing to increase on those energy reserves. That is not the case for renewables. Let's talk a little bit more about renewables. Um, that's unusual in the form of energy, because uh, among the energy forms, because the costs are coming down. You see on this graph that in 1976, you could buy a solar panel for $80 per watt. And by last year, uh, it cost under $1 per watt. And here's a point of pride. First solar here in Toledo is the cost leader in terms of manufacturing of solar panels. So their costs last year were about 75 cents per watt. So the cost of that form of energy in the last 35 years has come down by a factor of 100. Uh, that's huge, that's very unusual. Uh, on the other hand, we have not shown a great deal of resolve in terms of 
stimulating that transition to clean and sustainable energy. One thing that did happen is in 2009, in the, in the depths of our re Great Recession, uh, the DOE Loan Guarantee Program was set up, $16 billion. This has become a, um, a source of a huge amount of discussion that Solyndra has been taken, that name has been taken to uh, uh, represent the Loan Guarantee Program. And uh, it's been represented as a failed program. Actually, uh, a loan guarantee program is very much like a venture capital investment. And venture capitalists plan that about a third of their companies are going to fail. So they expect about a 30% failure rate. And the loan guarantee program also expected about a 30% failure, which would account to about $5 billion. In fact, the latest projections on the loan guarantee program indicate that it's going to be about $2.7 billion, or only about a 17% failure rate. So it's much more successful than we commonly anticipate. I'd like, I'd like to end with just another personal note. So my wife and I and family did come to Toledo for many very good reasons. And this is our home, which has Toledo-built solar modules on them. They were installed about eight years ago. And they have been absolutely maintenance-free. Uh, and then uh, we can use those solar modules to put electricity into the batteries of this electric truck. This is a truck which was built in the Toledo, Detroit area. And then it was a family project to convert it into electric about 14 years ago. And it's providing gasoline-free transportation for the last 14 years. <coughs> so I would conclude by saying Toledo is leading in the renewable electricity generation area, solar. And Toledo is poised to be a leader with cleaner transportation solutions as well. So, so often in history, we here in Toledo have been right in the middle of developing new technology and helping with that infrastructure development. And I believe that we will regain our national will to move toward a sustainable society and that Toledo is going to be right in the center of that clean power transition.